morning. I, I just want to take a moment um, because I, I feel, and I said this in ABF, uh, um, I had an ABF class and I have the sermon and it's daylight savings time morning, <laughs> right? So you know what it's like when you, when you wake up, in, when you're in school and you wake up and there's a big assignment due and you haven't started it yet? that feeling. Um, so I'm rustling through my pages and stuff over here in, this morning, and um, it's amazing how you can go from nervousness and will this work to just ready before your God to do whatever. And that, for me this morning, was a product of the giftedness of our worship team. And I really didn't catch it until it happened, but um, somewhere in that last song, I just felt ready. And we are so blessed, are we not, to have such a gifted and willing Uh, team of people to lead us to that place. I hope you are as ready to hear as I am to talk. And I think we just say thanks. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Well, you could talk, surely, I guess. (laughs) But it's still daylight savings time morning. Okay, that's not going away. Um, Apparently, it's not going away. Didn't we, like, vote for $30 car tabs and no more daylight savings time? And I don't know. But it's here, and uh, and it happened, and we'll greet the folks who come in later. (laughs) But I want to share a daylight savings time story. Um, And um, I got plenty of notice about this preaching date. And I was really well prepared, and I sent notes to Pastor Jim and to Pastor Dave. And then we went to the Pacific Northwest Leadership Conference Friday and Saturday. And I I rewrote the sermon on the way back. You know, I mean, prepare, 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 do over. But daylight savings time. Uh, My son... Uh, he's a wonderful man. He's a hard worker. He's a great husband, great dad. And uh, some of you, a few of you have had the opportunity to meet him. And I am so proud of him. Um, but as a child, he was just like me. He didn't like to get up in the morning. And, um, and so the mornings around daylight savings time were the worst. Well, hey, fall back. Everybody loves that, right? Fall back is great. But this spring forward idea was just offensive to his very soul. And somewhere along second grade, um, he decided he was, he was going to hold the line against this nonsense. And he made it all the way to Tuesday with, you know, through gritted teeth, asking, but what time is it really? (laughs) And and we got to talking, you know, because I was just wondering, what this is really going on. And uh, I had to ask him, I said, do you notice that the, the clocks at school are changed, too? And the bus comes, you know, when you expect it to, and... And he's thinking that through, yeah, yeah, yeah. He thought that daylight savings time was just dad's dumb idea. (laughs) You know? No, 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 this will be great. We'll turn the clocks forward an hour, and we'll have more daylight. And it was such, I mean, it was an eye-opener for me, because I was wondering, why is he being so resistant? But he just thought it was something our family was doing. Something wacky and goofy, not a reality for the greater world. 
And my goodness, but sometimes doesn't our faith feel like that? It's just our religious notion or, or something isolated to the Christian community. But our faith, the core of our existence before a living and holy God, is just not something shared by the greater reality out there. We, we can feel and sense that, that isolation and that, different, that differentness. And that is not a modern dilemma. The facts of the resurrection of Christ and the, the very cornerstone of our gospel, our eternal hope, it's been dismissed and denied from the earliest days. I want you to consider just two examples. Peter, in his second letter, he wrote to Christians. For we did not follow cleverly contrived myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Instead, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And in, in his letter, Peter goes on to describe his experience on the Mount of Transfiguration when Christ was glorified and shining before him in heavenly glory. Moses and Elijah were there speaking with him. Peter was on his face, and he witnessed it with John and with James. He saw the glorified Christ. And he said, we didn't make this stuff up. We were there, and that's what we proclaim to you a reality. In Acts chapter 26, the Apostle Paul is giving testimony. He's been in chains for a while now. And he's using that, he's leveraging his imprisonment to proclaim the gospel, the truth of the resurrected Christ, in higher and higher courts before government officials. In this case, he is before Governor Festus and King Agrippa. And in giving his defense, he testifies to the gospel, to the resurrection of Christ, affirming before the king and governor that Jesus died, was buried, and rose from the dead according to the Scriptures. And Festus openly suggests that too much study has made Paul crazy. But Paul addresses the court. And he says, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. On the contrary, I'm speaking words of truth and good judgment. For the king knows about these matters, King Agrippa. It's to him that I'm actually speaking boldly. For I am convinced that none of these things, that is, the truth of the resurrection, that none of these things have escaped his notice, since this was not done in a corner. The resurrection didn't happen on a dark and stormy night. More than 500 people at one time saw Christ after the crucifixion, alive, and testified to that. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, you can go find them today. Many of them are still alive. They will testify to the reality of the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. The Christian faith, our faith, is a tangible reality. It's anchored in real time and place. It's witnessed and experienced by and communicated one to another faithfully in the, to the, right up to the present day and will be until Christ returns. And I intend to carry on that faithful tradition today to proclaim the reality of Christ. So witnesses to these events, they wrote biographical accounts, we call them the Gospels, and they wrote letters to the church as encouragement and 
teaching and training, sometimes correction. And as the life of the Christian community, it was in tra- a transition from being led by eyewitnesses to these truths to becoming a community that was a majority of folks who had, to whom this information had been transmitted. That was a transition. And of course, this is the very plan and purpose of God. I, I don't want you to hear that and think, oh, this was a time when the church was, uh, when the message was losing its integrity because the eyewitnesses were dying off. When Jesus prayed in John 17, he prayed for those that the Lord had given to him. And then he said, and not only those, Lord, but those who will come to believe because of their message. John 17, 20. That's us. And that is everybody between the believers sitting in these seats today and the ones who heard it from John and Peter and James and Andrew and the eyewitnesses. That was the very purpose of God and it was the prayer of Jesus that this is the way the church would grow. So in our passage today, we do have a passage, by the way. (laughs) The first chapter of John's first letter to the church. John celebrates Christ's real victory in real time over real sin, resulting in real fellowship with God and with others. If you're using one of the blue chair Bibles, I just looked it up. It's on page 1021. And as we walk down through these first four verses, we will see that the message of the gospel is grounded in in reality, and that is John's opening message. That is his thesis statement as he begins this letter to the church. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we've seen it and testify to and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we're writing you these things so that our joy might be complete. Do you see a similarity between John's gospel, the first sentence of John's gospel, and the first sentence of this? Right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That which was from the beginning, that was the the eternal Word of life that was with the Father, came to be with us. He's essentially starting this first letter just like he started his gospel. The experience of the disciples and their followers was a physical reality of the incarnate Christ. It started in heaven and it came down. Jesus, the life and light of heaven, came hiding, disguised in human flesh, and lived among us. And John says, we touched it, we heard it, we saw it, we were there, we experienced this, and that's what we're telling you. This is what we're giving to you. And when I do that, when I tell you about this, you and I have fellowship. When you believe the message, now we have a bond. 
We have fellowship with one another. And our fellowship is with the Father. And in, in, this, in this very poetic way, John is describing the, the purpose and plan of God that we call the church. That Christ came down and made an eternal difference in time and real place. And that we have now a bond between people that didn't exist before. And that bond is also a unity with the very God of heaven, the holiness of God. And for John, and, and whoever he means when he says we, as he writes this, because even from the early days, there were ministry teams. Paul was part of a ministry team, and much of his writing uses we. To give away this message, to tell this truth, completes, and, and to create that bonding of the church, that creates complete joy for John and for us. It is the completion of the gospel, of hearing and believing the gospel message, to pass it on. It's not a joy contained. It's always meant to be a joy completed by moving it on to the next person, the next believer. It's not a clever myth. It's not a made-up philosophy. John is talking about people being united with one another and with a God who is holy and perfect. And these are not just random points of interest. John declares that the most important problem facing humanity has been resolved. Do you get the strength of that statement? The gospel is not a hopeful maybe. It's a complete solution. Now, I want to give you an idea of what I mean in that. So let's rewind. We're just a few pages from the end of the Bible. So remember the story at the beginning? When everything was good, and everything God made was good, and then he made people, and, and he gave them assignments, and he gave them blessing. He gave them the provision of work to do, and the provision of garden to eat, and said, go on. And obey me. And we turned away. Everything was good. Very good. And I like to call that moment, because I'm not really a big theological you know, powerhouse, the beginning of bad. Before that, there was no bad. God did not create bad. We did. And the day that Adam and Eve made their fateful decision to trust a snake instead of God, before that, everything was good. And what happened the first moment after the beginning of bad? The two people, the only two people on earth, hid from each other. Two people who, apart from a few moments with Adam and God, had never known loneliness or isolation or rejection. Immediately were frightened and hiding and afraid of the one person created to complete them. That picture, that, that visual has continued. We hide from each other because of shame, because of fear, because of sin. And the very next thing is that God comes into the garden. 
God was in the garden. We can talk about om- omnipresence, right? But he was there. But he made his presence known to them. And what did they do? But they hid from God. They ran from the solution. And they hid as if they could. The reality of sin is that it separates us from others and it drives us from God into hiding. Shame. And it's a byproduct of rejecting God, rejecting His reality. But now that issue's done. The Bible's clear. The good news of the gospel is grounded in reality. This is why when John starts out, the very things he says when he proclaims, how good is this gospel? Bad has been undone. We have fellowship with one another, and our fellowship is with the Father. The the sight, the tragic sight we see in the garden is repaired based on John's proclamation. So he continues through verses 5 and 10, and we'll walk down through these, that the reality of our sin, it does separate us from God, but the reality of God's faithful forgiveness unites us with our holy God. In verse 5, John clearly states the condition. This is the message that we've heard from him and we proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. So let's take a little moment and think about darkness and light. He's using metaphors. These are commonly used in other scriptural contexts and they're easily understood as contrasting good and bad. Holiness, purity, and perfection are the light, contrasted with wrong, distorted, ruined, the darkness. But I want you to see here that there are more subtle shades or expressions of this light and darkness. Unity versus separation, light and darkness. Fellowship versus isolation. Acceptance versus shame. Consider this. In God, there is unity, fellowship, and acceptance. And there is absolutely no separation, isolation, or shame. God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. So next, John is going to take up three human responses, very familiar responses. We'll see ourselves here. To sin and shame and why they make the problem, why these responses make the problem worse and not better. Verse 6, hypocrisy. If we say we have fellowship in him, with him and we walk in darkness, we lie. And we don't practice the truth. Hypocrisy is wearing a mask. Walking in darkness. I say that I am part of the body of Christ. But my hidden sin and shame says otherwise. In me. And I really am isolated from you guys. If I have one foot in the darkness and I think I have one foot in the light, I'm actually living a lie. I'm living a double life. And that's really no life at all. And the truth of the gospel is not penetrating through to create change.
But verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That's really easy to read. But in other places, John reminds us that we love, as humans, we love the darkness more than the light because we relate to the darkness in us. I don't really want you guys to know the darkness in me. If I walk in the light, that is meaning I'm walking in truth and openness about just exactly what I have been redeemed from. And I'm not hiding from God or hiding from you guys. Now, we'll talk in more detail about this, but this is the raw data that the, the Christian community of which we are a part is a place of unity and acceptance and fellowship. And there is no place for hiding behind fig leaves or thinking that you're hiding from God. And notice in verse 7, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Okay, pump the brakes there before we go on to the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin, which is good news. But we always must consider the reverse. Right? If we walk in darkness and in light, which is just a foolish proposition in and of itself, if we walk in hidden sin and darkness and shame, we don't have fellowship with each other. I am convinced that part of the difficulty that the church has in being healthy at times is because of this lack of fellowship with one another. Not that we are not doing it, but clearly, there is sin and shame that is hidden. And if you think you can live that double life and come into church on Sunday and be contributing to the church, what's happening is sickness is coming in through the front door. Darkness is coming in. This fellowship with others and with God that John proclaims does not work in the presence of the double life, the hypocrisy. And this hypocrisy is the height of foolishness because of the second part of that sentence. The blood of Jesus Christ washes us, cleanses us from all sin. There is no excuse for holding back from confession. There is no excuse for us to suffer in shame. Uh, the second, second common human event is denial. If we deny the reality of sin, we're self-deceived in verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have no sin, um, I guess one way to look at that is if we say we have no sin, we're not looking hard enough. We're not looking in the right places. 
Or perhaps we're dismissing what God calls sin. As I, I had the real blessing of sharing discipleship journeys with people over about the last decade or more, there's something that I, uh, I, I often warn people um, new to spiritual development and spiritual growth. It's that you might think that you've got like a top five things to overcome. And man, if you can just get those sins out of your life, you'll be golden. The longer you grow in Christ, the more you perceive how sinful you really are. Oh, sure, I got rid of, you know, smoking and drinking and running around with girls that do. But now I see the envy and the jealousy and the hate that's really in the depths of my heart. And what am I going to do about those? Gee, I just can't quit envy. I need to be changed. I need to be transformed. I need to grow. If we say we have no sin, keep looking. And confess our sins, and he is faithful and just. I really like that view of faithful and just. When we acknowledge our sin, he will really do as he promised. Right? I, I remember a story of a couple that came to a pastor and, and they said, you know, we just don't feel like God's forgiven us. And, and he took them right to 1 John 1. And he said, well, you've confessed your sins. Yes. But we really don't feel like God's forgiven us. And going around this circle a few times, the pastor finally landed. He said, I know what your problem is. You're unbelievers. <laughs> They've been Christians for a long time, part of the church. No, that's... God said, if you confess your sins, I'll forgive them. If you don't think he was honest, then you're an unbeliever. But we have to take God at his word that he is faithful. And he will apply a real removal of our sins. Faithful, also think righteous. He, he will do this. And then just, no sweeping our failures under the rug, but dealing with them through the voluntary, substitutionary, and lawful work of, of the cross. This is not just an illustration or a suggestion of holiness. Our complete cleansing from sin is the reality. It's the reality that is as genuine as the truth that there was a man hung upon a cross for our sins and that he died and he rose. And it didn't happen in secret, but it was a public event and it continues to be proclaimed today. Finally, verse 10, the reality. God says you're a sinner in his revealed word. To be in conflict with a holy God is, as Martin Luther would say, is um, neither wise nor safe. It's to be in conflict with the truth. If you want to know unreality, fantasy, myth, it's that there isn't such a thing as sin or truth. To claim anything other than I am a desperate sinner before a holy God 
is to claim that God lied, that the Scriptures lie. And that takes us right back to the beginning of bad. When God said one thing and a snake said another, and by agreeing with the snake, our ancestors said, yeah, God's not telling us the truth. Take God at his word in completeness. Well, I've got three conclusions that I want to draw to this. And they're kind of like applications. But maybe not. Number one, celebrate reality. Part of our worship service today, part of the meaning of, of all of us gathering together here, okay? And, and singing, again, having gifted people, gifted by God the Holy Spirit, no less, to lead us into celebration of real truth, the way the world actually is. The salvation and healing and new life offered in the scriptures is actually the way the world works. It's not just dad's goofy idea. Even if you heard the gospel from dad. Real people in the real past experienced a supernatural miracle. And it split human history into before and after. And I know you can watch Discovery Channel and they say BCE and Common Era and stuff. They're not fooling anybody. It's the same day. Call it what you like. It's the same cross that history had to leap across. And humanity has a before and an after. Celebrate that reality. Um, and second, and this goes uh, pretty squarely to Discovery Channel, National Geographic, my friend Bill Nye. There is no conflict in reality. There is no conflict with reality, right? Conflict with reality is insanity. Diagnosis. It either is or it isn't. What I mean is, is if somebody wants to boldly assert that I didn't have a mother, I don't have to take that person's education or social status or uh, TV and movie credentials into account. I had a mother. We don't have to fight over it. If you don't want to believe that, you're not diminishing my mother's existence. I don't have to take those things into account against reality. They are judged to be on the wrong side on the basis of reality, not on the basis of my argument or my insecurities. I don't have to hate. I don't have to hurt and I don't have to hide. What I need to do is to refer to point one and celebrate reality. Third, and this is where his conclusions, right? Because I don't think applications have an A, B, and C, and this one does. John talked about confession, and I want to be really, really clear here as though I'm talking to my four-year-old grandson. Okay, eyes, I need eyes. No matter how shameful and depraved sin is, it's a human condition. And to quote Mr. Rogers, anything human can be talked about. But not every opportunity to open up is safe or wise. 
please consider these three ABC guidelines personally. For some, the reality of our redemption in Christ will result in complete wholeness and recovery from the wounds of our sin. Sweet freedom. To confess their sin before God brings freedom and restoration. And my experience says these people are in the minority. It's a good minority. For others, the empathetic and compassionate words of fellow believers are needed. And not everyone can hear the deep and desperate shame that has ensnared and isolated a person and then love and affirm them, affirm to them both the truth of God's faithfulness and the full acceptance in the body of Christ. Do not wait alone in fear and shame one moment longer than you must. But don't unwisely expose yourself to an immature or untrustworthy fellow Christian. That's a real thing. We're all growing in Christ, but not all of us are at the same place. I can speak confidently about our pastor and our elders. And uh, without warning, could our elders stand? Just wouldn't want them to be unknown. I, um, I, I'm, I'm working with these men, and I'm starting to know their hearts. And they will bear your burdens with you, and they will take your secrets to their graves. Amen? Thank you, guys. And finally, for everyone, we as the body of Christ are constrained by the law of love to protect the sanctity, and I use that word intentionally, the sanctity of this Christian community to be a safe place. To practice affirming one another and accepting one another day by day, regardless of the case or regardless of the cost, that this will be a safe place for a sinner to be rescued and for each and every one of us to grow out of that hidden darkness within us and into God's glorious light. That is our responsibility as the body of Christ and it will make our joy complete. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your call is high. But your salvation is complete. So many of us, Lord, in the church have known and, and perhaps still know the isolation of sin, the past that we carry. Lord, I pray, and I, I know my trust is well placed, that you will guide the individual hearts hearing this message to walk free of shame and sin, to confess in safety and trust, and to be affirmed and accepted and healed by the body of Christ, your intended and purposeful means for rescuing us from all the depths of bad. 
that we would all come fully into your light because in you, Father, there is light. And there's no darkness at all. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for making all of this possible. Amen. Thanks for watching this video from Hillside Evangelical Free Church. Our hope is that these resources will help you grow as a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. We're located in Green Bank, Washington on Whidbey Island. And if you live in the area and are looking for a church home, we'd love to have you join us. You can find out more information at our website at hillside-efc.com.